Oh, okay. So part three. This is our final part of um, Angels and Demons. Apart from next week, where we'll do our discussion. Uh, I expect so many questions next week. So so many. Uh, but um, this one is about demonic activity and Christ victory. Um, important to add the Christ victory point. Uh, we need to keep this in mind as we look at this subject. Uh, this is relatively heavy uh, in terms of looking into the world and seeing what kind of activity is going on, uh, but also not to be overwhelmed by what is going on around us as well. We don't need to be as Christians. Uh, we will stay guarded uh, by the Holy Spirit, by God's word, uh, through the shield and through uh, the armor of God. So uh, this is what we're, we're looking at today. Um, I think when we look at this subject, uh, we need to obviously look around the world. We, we look at the world around us in our day to day, in the places that we work, the places that we go, uh, and just general observation. And I think what you'll find uh, is that people in general will probably likely sit on either end of, of the scale when it comes to the existence of demonic activity in our world today. Uh, and either they completely reject this concept uh, of demonic activity on the basis that they can't see it, they can't see it in front of them, they can't see it as a tangible thing, they can't touch it, they can't hear it, um, or on the other end they invest themselves so much into this demonic world uh, that they become obsessed uh, and even taken over by it. I uh, have heard many stories even as a, uh, a person who is young person at school uh, and, and a few stories of people who dabbled in this stuff and you know it's through word of mouth at the end of the day but um, stories like people being taken over by demonic things uh, it does happen and it's real uh, and so we need to understand where's where's the line though where do we draw the line between the obsession uh, and, and the righteousness of God so that we we know that we don't have to worry so much about it and become obsessed by it we would even say that demonic activity operates in tarot cards and all that sort of stuff. Uh, anything like horoscopes, unfortunately, that you may like. Uh, I certainly thought it was an okay thing uh, many years ago, um, but actually turns out it's probably a demonic thing in, in many ways. It speaks of a human effort, a human fate, a human coincidence uh, of sorts that were lining up of moons and stars and suns. Uh, it is um, used not for the good of man as far as I can work out. But what we must have, uh, as we learned last week, uh, is, a f is a first acceptance of the demonic uh, and then a proper respect for that existence in regards to how uh, the demonic is dealt with. Uh, so this week we'll learn, what we'll learn is to have this healthy awareness of demonic activity. Uh, it's always been, uh, but then how an acceptance of Jesus will literally liberate us and has liberated believers from any form of possession. And we'll talk about possession as well uh, and that's the thing that happens uh, and then reveals the continued activity of the demonic around us demonic that happens to us demonic that happens around us uh, and so that we're ready and aware of it uh, in case it comes and tries to persuade us to leave the lord to move away from his teaching and who he is so let's begin um i think we must as christians acknowledge first of all even though some would probably not want to, uh, that the very, the very least existence and influence of the demonic on this world and believers. And we need to start with the demonic influence itself. Uh, for non-believers, and I'm talking about those who reject the truth entirely uh, of the living God, those people are the first stop that the demonic influence operates on, on a consistent basis, uh, every time. Uh, and we see this example of Satan's default activity, I've called it. The default activity is basically to blind people from the truth of God's word. That's the starting point uh, for non-believers, and he will try and do that as a first port of call. Um, but we see this in this example, uh, when the Jews who oppose Jesus are influenced and by and persuaded by Satan himself. Uh, John 8, 41 to 45 says, You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. 
You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. How, in a small way, I can certainly align with this frustration uh, that Jesus has as he speaks to people uh, who reject him uh, and not see the truth plainly in front of them. Uh, this is, of course, they're no different to today as we look at this. We have many people around the world who will be affected by demonic activity perpetrated by Satan and his demons. But yet again, we need to emphasize that just as it was the choice of many in the time that Jesus was on earth to reject him, so it is still the choice today to reject God and so reject the truth. 1 John 3, 7 to 8 says, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. You see, the devil and his demonic activity operates today on the basis that many have to be deceived by him in order that the work is effective in any way whatsoever. Matthew 24 verse 10 says, At that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. There should be more to that. There should have been more. 11, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people uh, because of the increase of wickedness and the love of most will grow cold. The choice for someone to accept the lies of Satan is to invite demonic activity into their lives. It is that simple. And it sounds, might sound highly spiritual, it might sound a bit Christian-y to talk about this and, and say those sort of things, but the lies of Satan are not complicated. They're simply this, believe that there is no God, he says. And of course, I, I'm paraphrasing what you might find in scripture, but Effectively, his message is this, believe that God does not exist and that you are a God of your own destiny. And how often is that turned into a saying, a mantra of I am uh, the, um, I, I'm in charge of my own destiny. Uh, it's the same thing. It's a little God, me turning myself into a little God and claiming that I have power over my whole destiny just because of the words I speak, the things I say and the actions I take simply because I can refuse to believe in God, therefore God does not exist. Uh, and yet that is a lie. And so here is the lie that Satan perpetrates in his activity. He says, if you reject God, you can have freedom to do whatever you want. And you'll know this is to be true because the, the way people will say this is that they'll say they're free from religion. And they'll claim that what religion does is hold you down, is is, is pull you back and it, it controls you and it, it does all these mind control things to you. And so what they say is, well, I don't believe in that because I'm free. I'm free from all that stuff. I'm free from organized religion uh, is probably the quote most used against Christians and Christianity. But he says, if you reject God, you can have the freedom to do whatever you want in whatever way you deem it right. But rather than setting the unbeliever free, it in fact make them a slave to a different master. Romans 6 verse 16, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. Uh, this is an interesting verse because uh, we're going to see in the next thing, uh, next verse, next set, next screen, um, what it says about slavery in terms of the slave, the master that you have in effect. Um, but this is an interesting one because many Christians will look at this and say, oh, uh, non-Christians probably more likely will look at this and say, uh, so I'm a slave. I'm still a slave. doesn't matter whether I'm worshipping the devil or I'm worshipping God. I'm a slave in some form or another. And then use this weird sort of logic to then go, I don't believe in God and I don't believe in that. and I'm free. But it does not matter how much people think that not believing in God sets them free. It's a lie. Whatever happens, people will serve one of two masters. But here in these verses, one leads to death and the other leads to righteousness. 16 to 18 are the same 
uh, book, same chapter, don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you're slaves to the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you've come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness. Here's a weird thing about these verses. Uh, the same word is used, obviously, to say you're either slave to evil, slave to the devil, or you're slave to God. And obviously the logic would follow that I don't want to be a slave. But here's the weird thing about this verse that we, we would probably see as weird. The, the, the way this is used to say you're a slave is a slave to righteousness. And what does righteousness lead to? Righteousness leads to freedom. But here's the thing. When, when we're on earth, when, we're, when we decide whether we follow God or not, here's, here's what happens. When you follow God, you, we are slaves to righteousness. We are slaves to God. We are slave to obedience because that's what god calls us to be this is this is not some kind of new age ride we're going on here this is turning away from a life that says i can do whatever i want at whatever time i want to whatever person i like because that's right to me and it says god says no that's not right that's not okay that's not good that's not healthy for you the healthy thing to do is to be obedient to me because what that will do is lead to righteousness and in righteousness you'll be set free it's a problem when you read scripture too plainly that you might misunderstand the wording and what paul in this particular context is trying to get at but it doesn't matter how much people tell themselves that they are free from so-called religion or that humanity is good. Uh, I, I watched this uh, amazing video uh, of a guy that uh, is a teacher, really good teacher, and he, he feels questions from Christians and non-Christians. And his argument was, we don't need God uh, because humans are good, he said. Humans are good. And he said, so where did the good come from? Oh, we're just good. He says, no, no, that's, that's an act of what you're doing. He said, where did the good that you're claiming, where did it originate from? Or to say, he left him going around in circles. The only thing he could say is by his own observation, humanity was already good. But he said, but it has to come from somewhere, right? It has to come from a place to begin with in order for you to have a value, that human value, human life is worth something. And if you don't have that value to begin with, you can't have the value yourself. So you must have followed someone and, and learned from someone who that is and what that value is. And he ends up, by the end of this roughly eight-minute video or so, going, yeah, you've probably got a point. <laughs> Total non-believer suddenly reviewing his entire worldview on the basis that he thought human goodness comes out of nowhere. But that's all it took, was to question, make this question and say, but where does it come from? Why should we be good if there's no God? Why should we behave nice towards one another if there's no God? Who are we being good for? So it doesn't matter how much people tell themselves they're free. It doesn't matter how much tell them tell themselves that humanity is good. They're accepting the lie that God does not exist, that Jesus didn't die on the cross and that he was not resurrected. They are serving a different master. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one, love the other. You'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. <clears throat> Take a drink. And you might say, well, that's about God and money. The principle, though, stands. It doesn't matter whether it's money or anything else. The principle still stands. Even if you claim to not believe in God, you are serving a different master. Where your goodness comes from, where your uh, acts of whatever they are come from, you are serving something else, not God. The lie is that people are able to somehow sit on the fence. That non-believers can sit on a fence and say, yeah, but I don't, and this is probably uh, ag um, agnosticism. I can sort of accept there might be a God, but I don't want to necessarily believe in your God. But I want to believe in a God. 
And then you have to think, and I go round in loops. When I see these things happen, I go round in loops in my head. And I don't know why people cannot come out of this particular loop. I can believe that something exists. One person says, I believe there's a force. Not God. I believe there's a force. Okay, well, here's what I'm asking every time I see this. Just show me the evidence. Please show me the evidence that a force of something else exists. And I can show you tons of evidence that God exists, that Jesus was real, that he did what he did, that he, was, he died on the cross, that he rose again. I can show you that evidence. So there is no sitting on the fence as much as people want to believe they are. They've not been liberated. They've become slave to sin that leads to death. And a default position before any person accepts Christ is eternity in hell without forgiveness. We're born into sin. If we understand that how every person is destined to spend eternity without God, when they knowingly reject him, we have an understanding of the evil that is perpetrated in this world. The evil in the world is not due to some involuntary hypnosis. You, people have not been hypnotized in that they have no control over their minds. They are still able to make a choice, and they are making a choice, when either they accept God or reject him. It is our fault as human beings, due to our nature, our brokenness, and rejection of God, that we perpetuate evil towards one another. And then the defense always comes, doesn't it? I do good things. I do good things for charity. I go around the world helping people in other countries, poor people, all sorts of missionary work you can think of, non-Christian missionary work. I'm a good person comes the excuse. They might say they haven't committed this crime. I'm not as bad as that murderer who's in prison. I'm not as bad as that person that's done this or that. But it is the acceptance that irrespective of what we have done or haven't done, we are fully capable and therefore culpable to make ourselves open to demonic influence and therefore carry out these actions. Purely, we are opening ourselves to the influence of the devil. People refuse to believe because they've not only accepted the lies of Satan and have become slave to him, but that they know that to submit to God means that they have to let go of the false reality they've created for themselves. And this is a big step. I don't know where, what your experiences of becoming a Christian, uh, of, of, of growing in the Lord. And it, I, I don't think it's, it's only when the moment you, you come to Jesus, but seemingly every day there's something that i have to think about not doing anymore it may, it may not be sin but it may be an act maybe something in my behavior that may be leading me to it it might lead me to sin it might, might open a weakness in me so every day there's a sense of thinking well i have to not be the person i, I was because jesus i've accepted jesus as lord but i have to take part in that, in that sense. I have to obey God and follow what he wants me to do. I have to follow his commands. So they know that submit to God, we know that su to submit to God means we have to change the reality, as it were, that we've had in our lives, the thing that we've set in front of us. That has to change. That, that lie, that false reality is, is a lie that man is good. While ignoring the very real evidence of everyday life that man is evil and in need of redemption. I think most, we would probably mostly agree, Christian or not, when you watch the news, the news is mostly full of bad news. And isn't it interesting that they have to try and uh, rescue it at the end with some good news story? that makes you feel better inside, isn't it? There is something where we might say the news is obsessed with bad news because it, it gets 
the website clicks and it gets the viewers. I think, I think they're onto something. I think the fact there's so much bad news is a reflection of the world. It's truly a reflection of what's going on around us. It's not that they just necessarily pick things, although could demonic activity be influenced in the media? Hey, look, if you're not Christian, you're not protected. If you don't believe in Jesus, you are opening yourselves up to demonic activity. It says the lie that man is good, we ignore the evidence in front of us and make up this weird reality that we don't have any evidence for. Ignore the fact that we are in need of redemption entirely. So we, as Christians, we must do our part in this world that is very much under demonic activity. We must first always be right with God every day as we seek his teaching and sanctification. We must every day enjoy his grace, his mercy, his salvation. To us, they're completely undeserving. So that we can tell those who serve a master under death that they can serve a very different master who actually leads to freedom. You don't have to go to death. You don't have to go to hell. You can have eternal life with Jesus. 2 Timothy 2, 22 to 26, lots of twos. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. I think it's difficult as a Christian when you, you know the truth, and not only is it I'm not talking about a truth that when you say, I just know God exists. But when you know it so much because you read the Bible and you, you can see the evidence right in front of you. How hard is this to be gentle to an opponent? And you kind of just, depending on the person, you're just going to want to shake them and go, wake up out of this slumber. But here he says, don't get into arguments. And this is really wise counsel. This is really good stuff. And I'll tell you why. We've done this before and we spoke about how to turn away from arguments. Psalm says that as well. I think it's Proverbs actually. Proverbs says to turn away from arguments, to not get involved when someone is, is purposefully trying to get to you and get at you, run away. But this is really good advice because here's what happens. If you react, as difficult as this is, if you react in a way that says you're going to enforce God's word onto somebody. That's what has, that's how they perceive the God you believe in. And it, it can be a very small thing. If I force my arguments so much that what I'm actually doing is just believe anyway. Don't worry about the evidence, just believe because otherwise you're going to hell. That's, I don't think that's the God of the Bible. Even it says right here, be gentle with your opponents. We want them to turn away from the devil, not to still act like the devil and then turn to God because it won't work. The two aren't compatible. There must be a peace that comes over us when we come to realize Christ is Lord and Savior. So what does this look like from a Christian perspective? How does the Christian live a life while still being susceptible to demonic activity we find in the world? If you look back at every verse, I won't go back over them now, but if you look back at all, probably nearly all the verses I've quoted already, uh, you will find that there is an alternative way to go. It's interesting that scripture never leaves you in the place of you are sinful, you deserve death, you deserve hell, it is hard and then it comes back out the other side and says, but there is a way. You can trust in Jesus and you can be redeemed. You don't have to go to that place. You can go to a different place. You can serve a different master who the master who wants to set you free from the slave, slavery of sin. 
And that is the challenge uh, for the Christian. We need to decide that we're going to live honorably to God. It's not just stopping of living in the flesh, but to turn and live in the spirit of Christ. Romans 8, uh, 5 to 10 says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. Uh, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Uh, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit. If needed, the spirit of God lives in you. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. What great news that is. Sometimes Paul can get, uh, certainly Romans, can get quite heavy. Uh, let me say this uh, when we look at these verses in particular. You cannot do anything about this broken body right here. This mind that is influenced by the world that's broken by sin. And this is why Paul speaks of the spirit rather than focusing on whether I do, I look good in front of God. This is why the spirit is important. If I accept the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour, I don't live to the flesh to serve the flesh, even though I'm tempted by it, even though I might even fall to it sometimes. But as the Holy Spirit indwells in me, my, my focus is now no longer on the flesh, but is on serving, honouring God. But the flesh will always be in enmity with the spirit. It'll always be in a fight and a struggle with the spirit. We don't change in our bodily, in our sinful way, in that sense, in our fleshly way just because we now have the spirit instead we want the spirit to live to god and so we, we trust the spirit we go if something happens if we sin against god we can come to him and say lord i know i've sinned and i, I want your holy spirit to do some work in me prayerfully give it up to god don't try and make this impressive god's not impressed with this God's not impressed with this guy. <laughs> He's impressed with his son, Jesus Christ. It is a change from one way of living to an entirely different way of living, an entirely different goal. For the Christian, it's undeniable uh, that we need to choose to live to honour Christ, not only every day, but in every thought and action. And why is that? Because to do anything less is to allow a foothold for the devil to get into our lives. Romans 8 verse 12 to 14, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. Obligation. But it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God and are, are the children of God. You see, in order that we're not overtaken by demonic activity in this world, by the Prince of Darkness himself, it is vital that we are full of the Spirit. That you know Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again so that all sins forevermore are paid for. To be full of the Spirit, and it, this might sound like a complex notion, but actually it's not. It's not something you have to work for to get the Spirit. You know that. You you don't have to make you don't have to do something to make the Spirit more so in you. Once you accept Jesus, He gives you the Holy Spirit. But there's no amount of jumping up and down that will make that any more. You're either full of the Spirit, overflow with the Spirit, or you don't have the Spirit at all. Does that make sense? You're not working for the Spirit, okay? You're not going to do anything impressive that God says, oh, I'm only going to give you half full. But if you do this and that, I'm going to give you the full of the Spirit. I'm going to give you everything of the Spirit. Believe in Jesus, full of the Spirit. So to be full of the Spirit is to be born again, accept Jesus as your Saviour. Who would have thought it was that simple? Now, don't we make it complicated? 
But the reason why this is an everyday reality, not just some one-off event, is because we're looking for just the experience of God. Sometimes we just want an experience of God. What he wants is for us to submit and obey. It's so simple. We don't need to look for the experience. We don't need to look for a great feeling. Jesus was put on the cross. He went on the cross himself, allowed to be put on the cross. And, and they stabbed him. And then they killed him. And here's maybe me in a different time of my Christian walk going, I want more. Give me more than that, Jesus. That's really sad, isn't it? We've just accepted that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And here we go. But I want a bit more than that. Can you not give me more than your death and resurrection, please, Jesus? Just imagine the offense that is to God. Sending his son to die on the cross. And we're saying, you know what? I just want a bit more. We need to come to submission to God every day in recognition of his amazing grace. Or well, here's what we risk being. Matthew 23, 28. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to, be, appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. We cannot forget how every, every day, how the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection has saved us from hell. We don't need any more than that. You don't need to worry about anything more than that. I no longer have the blinders on and I'm not living to a lie that says, God's not happy with you. Or you better feel guilty about what you've done. I don't do that anymore because Jesus came and I accepted Jesus and Jesus paid the price for my sin. So I can't do anything else or anything more. Accept, glorify God, praise and worship him. Hallelujah, Lord. Matthew 12, 43 to 45. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places, seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. It's not enough to seek an experience with God. It is only through genuine repentance that we've disobeyed a holy God that will be truly redeemed and have the Holy Spirit live in that once empty house. Jesus uses an example here, an analogy, to describe, and I, this, when I read this, it always gets me. I always get to the point where it says, uh, this empty house, and I, I realize that's us, that is what he's talking about. But then he says in the verses, it's all neat and tidy. It's all put away. But it's like no one's living there. The house is empty, it's almost ready to be occupied. Maybe that's what Jesus is saying. He is saying that. Holy Spirit is not living in this house, but it's open for other residents, not the Holy Spirit. So when we accept the Holy Spirit, when we accept God as our Lord and Saviour, he won't be living under some temporary rental agreement. Temporarily taking up residence in you. He'll go even further than that. He'll take ownership of you. He'll take ownership of that house. And the Holy Spirit is your new, gracious, and loving, ever-powerful, best landlord you've ever had. Even the best landlord is not as good as the Holy Spirit. He 
He will keep what was once your house in better condition than you could have ever done yourself. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. For this reason, when the Holy Spirit takes residence in us, there is room for no other. For those that are Christ's, they cannot be demonically possessed. If you're a believer in Jesus, you believe he died and he rose again, that he is the son of God and is God himself. You cannot be possessed by demons. God is not in the habit of sharing his glory with demons. He just isn't. At no point is there any reference to a believer being possessed by demons. In fact, the Bible does state that if we're not empty, if we have the, in, uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, then it is impossible for any other spirit to possess us. That's meant to be good news. It is. 1 John 4 verse 4, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. There is no reason you could give me to say that if a Christian comes up and says, I think I'm possessed by a demon. And for that person to be a Christian, there has to be some review of that. If the one who is God himself is greater than any other thing in the world, including the devil, then he cannot be beaten by the devil. He, cannot, he won't share anything with the devil. He won't give anything to him. And so it is sad that we do see many instances in the world and in churches around the world where people who claim to be Christian go to the front to ask for a demon to be taken out of them. If a demon is possessing somebody, it is because they do not have the Holy Spirit indwelling in them. And you, you can disagree with me if you want, but I'm reading scripture. If the one who is in you cannot be overcome by anything else, then you cannot be possessed by anything else. Therefore, you must have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. I'm afraid on the evidence from the Bible that if someone claims to be a Christian, yet believes to be inhabited and possessed by a demon, then a review of what they believe about Jesus and who they know him to be needs to be carried out. This is why I say it's simply not acceptable to have an experience of God. It is to accept who he says he is, experience or not. Christians are, however, subject to attacks, subject to temptation from demonic activity, but they cannot be possessed by both God and the demon. So what about demonic possession of non-believers? What are Christians to do? This does happen. But here's what I don't think is helpful. I don't think it's helpful to be wildly over the top and do this dangerous activity of casting out demons by standing on stage and doing these elaborate acts. I was listening to John Piper, and some of you may know who he is, a uh, big theologian in America, uh, and he said uh, he had one experience of someone being demonically possessed in a school, and it was a young woman, and he said, so they asked him, what was your experience with that? What did you do when she was, you know, she was doing things uh, that we'll, I'll, I'll show you in the Bible, uh, but she was doing these same things. She was rolling around, she was shouting, she was angry, she was frothing at the mouth all those things. Uh, and then he said, uh, so, so did you like cast out the demon? I said, no. We started singing. So we simply started worshipping God around her. He said, as more and more people started singing, so more and more people started singing. And then we just got around her. And we kept singing glory to God, glory to God. It wasn't even a proper song in the sense of a song that they knew. They just come out with words. And they were singing in the spirit. And this girl stops. And she's on the floor and they help her up and she says what happened 
There's no need for this great act, this great acting to be done by churches. It's simply the fellowship of believers that get around that believe in God and go, Lord, you're going to do the work. We're going to pray for this person. Pray that they're no longer possessed by demons. The reason I don't believe in this elaborate act of casting out demons, as it were, is because the act itself is designed to give fame and glory to the one performing on the stage, not glory to the one true God who makes it possible. Matthew 7, 21 to 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons, and in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. What it comes back to is our relationship with God. When the seven sons of Sceva saw the success Paul had in exercising demons as he was doing the work, they started invoking the name of Jesus to command demons out of people. They said, that looks good. Might even make a bit of money out of it. But here's what happened. Acts 19, 15 to 16. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I know about. But who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. Seven sons. Seven. That's seven probably healthy-ish young guys. One man possessed by a demon, evil spirit, jumped them, overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Demons are dangerously powerful spirit beings, much stronger than we are. They can cause people they possess to do incredibly violent and uncontrollable things. Demons recognize valid authority, as we've just learned in the verses. And they fear God. The authority over demons belongs to only to Jesus and to those to whom Jesus gave it. It's interesting that the demon pointed out Paul in particular. Because what this tells us about this particular incident and this moment is that for that time in particular, Jesus, certainly the Holy Spirit, gave Paul the power, as it were, to cast out demons. But that is by no means something to take for granted. The reason why the demon said Paul in particular, because they knew that Jesus gave him the power to do that. So demons cannot be cast out via a formula or some ritual or even invoking Jesus' name. In the sense of just saying his name. Just saying the name is not something that's going to solve the problem. The first thing is, is our relationship with God right? Do I actually believe in the one I'm invoking the name of? Do I trust in the one I'm invoking the name of? Do I, do I ask for forgiveness from the one that I'm invoking the name of? Do I trust that he's Lord and Saviour of my life in the one I'm invoking the name of? The key here is that the power belongs to Jesus alone. When the sons failed to realise, uh, what they failed to realise is that Paul uh, used Jesus' name. When he did, he was trusting in Jesus' power to do the exorcism. The power of the Holy Spirit was not present in the sons of Sceva. Doing it for profit, doing it for show, peddling the Bible like it's some, something to make money out of. We see this in Luke, even when the, the followers of Christ came back to report to Jesus the work they did in exercising demons from many, Jesus gives some context to their work. He says, calm down. Luke 10 verse 20, however, do not rejoice that the Spirit submits to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jesus says, be careful. Be careful. Do not be taken by the signs and the wonders, for I could take it away from you like that.
Above anything else, we can know for this for sure. Whatever demonic activity goes on around us, and even to us, we need to know the God who provides protection we need. Deuteronomy 20 verse 4, For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you, for you, against your enemies to give you victory. Not you, he fights for you. To believe in Jesus and receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is absolutely vital in having nothing else take us away from God. It's the only way we will not be deceived by the lies of Satan and so avoid succumbing to the demonic activity in this world. True freedom from the lies of this world can only be found in accepting Christ as our Lord and Saviour. So we should continue to build each other up in prayer as we seek unity in Christ so his church can continue to be this beacon, beacon of hope against the schemes of the enemy. This is why uh, we want people to come, not because we want to grow the numbers, not because we want thousands of people to turn up, but we want every single person who walks through the door to believe in the Jesus of the Bible. We're not looking for momentary flirtings with an experience of God. We want to help people in a relationship with God. So we need to continue to pray for people we know, the community around us, to see Christ's victory over the power of the enemy. We need to pray that people will see through his deception and come to a true freedom in Christ. It is only by his power, by his spirit, that any of this will be successful. And even then, here is the thing we need to be aware of. As we pray for people and we, we, we keep making sure we're focused on Jesus, knowing that he's the one doing all the exorcising, exorcising of demons, of protecting people from demonic influence, knowing he is the one doing it, we must stay humble. Far too often we can get ahead of ourselves and think, just like they did in Luke, right? Lord, all the demons are rushing every time we come and say, in Jesus' name. Be careful. Always go back to the glory of God. It's only for his power and by his power that we are able to even pray for those people. So I do encourage you, as we move forward in the uh, uh, in september going forward pray, if you're able to come to our prayer meetings that are going to start they're simply prayer meetings there's no agenda if you're able to make it you're more than welcome and we're just going to sit and we're going to maybe think about some things put some things forward in a safe space and say oh, i just need some prayer for this we're just going to keep it simple but we need to pray this this street needs to be broken this community needs to be broken and I can, I can tell you that many have tried, and many have failed. And I wonder, I wonder whether that's because we're trusting in our own effort and not in the Holy Spirit. So let's pray, and then we'll worship together. Oh Lord, thank you. Uh, thank you for your Holy Spirit, who uh, on the acceptance of Jesus Christ, uh, that you are Lord and you are our Saviour, that you died on the cross for all our sins forevermore, that you rose again, that you are the Son of God who is God, that on that admission, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you that we have our protection in you. Thank you, Lord, that actually the reason why we may see more of maybe the attacks against us is because you make us through your Holy Spirit uh, more acute to them, more aware that they're going on. Thank you, Lord, that you've removed the blinders from our eyes, the blinders from our heart that used to say, I don't need God. But now, able to come in total submission God who waits patiently for those to 
give up the resistance. Pray for many here, Lord, in, in this community that many will give up the resistance. They don't need to fight a useless battle. They're not going to win. And instead, come and believe in Jesus, the side of victory. Pray, Lord, that many will turn to you. Pray, Lord, you'll keep us aligned. Keep us on the path of your Holy Spirit that we may continue to seek your guidance. Seek humility in everything we do, Lord, that we may not get above ourselves and ahead of ourselves. That we may always come back and glorify the one who made it possible. So we thank you, Lord, and praise your name. In Jesus' name. Amen.